right, so we have a zip file to download today. Here we have the crime.zip. Uh, go ahead and download that and extract it. And it uh, doesn't matter so much where you put it, but just so much you have access to it, we'll be referring to it through our code today. We got extract it. Question? So this Samuel Adams? That was Samuel Adams, 1778. Just recorded the attendance quiz. But I won't post it. This video until tomorrow, so we'll deal with that. Was it the was it the most humble the one that the dash drive with that famous painting that's on the dash drive? Alright, so go ahead and get crime.zip downloaded and extract it. Did I tell you about the story about getting this data from the FBI? No. Does that sound familiar? The strangest thing. It was several years ago, probably 2010 or 2011. I was looking for an interesting data set to use for various things. I came across some summary data of this particular data. This is this is crimes that are reported on university campuses uh, throughout the country. And it was on some FBI data site. And there was a little link. If you want the source data, email this email address. I said, oh, I want the source data. So I emailed the email address. And um, you know, I said, hey, you know, I'm a professor teaching this class. I'd love to have this data for whatever. And two weeks later, a CD, I didn't get any response. A CD just shows up. Here's a CD with all this data on it. Oh, thank you. A CD, yeah. What's, what's that? What's that? The that's what anyway, that's what it is. <laughs> What'd you say? It's the government. It's the government. That's your tax dollars at work. They didn't charge me for it. They just, you know, they just spent your money sending me this data. I, and then I don't know. It was like three weeks, two, three, maybe a month later. I got a call. I was in my office, and the phone rang. I looked over the caller ID, and it says Federal Bureau of Investigation. Listen, when you get a call from the FBI. There's a moment where you go, what have I, what have I done? No. I, lead, I, I lead a really, really boring life. You know? it's like, it didn't take me long to review all the things I, that I'd done and thought, no, the FBI's not asking for any of those things. You know, but fortunately, I picked, the, picked up the phone before it went to voicemail. Um, uh, um, hello? Hello. Um, I think I might have said, you know, Professor Allen. Oh, Professor Allen. Um, did we send you a CD with some data on it? I said, um, Yes. <laughs> Where does this go? It's a strange call. Oh, good, because that was our original. Can you send it back to us? <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> oh, they had like an intern or something. I don't know. Oh, Professor Allen needs some data. Send this to him. You know. Oh, you were supposed to copy it before you sent it. I guess so. <laughs> it's like a relief when the, when the FBI calls him. That's all it takes to get rid of him. <laughs> ah, yeah, let me, I'll send that back straight away. If you want a FedEx, I can have it to you by tomorrow. Whew. Okay. Anyway, so that's the data that we're, that we're getting. Download again, extract it, and then uh, we'll start with a blank workbook. So just go ahead and open up a new one. Uh, I guess we'll, we'll go ahead and explore this data a little bit. Hmm. What if it's on Yes. right extract. Prime, there we go, so prime. So it's just, it's just a bunch of Excel files. We've got Alabama, Alaska, Arizona. Let's look at Texas. Texas has got a bunch of schools. We'll just kind of take a little tour of this data while you're getting it down. You don't have to open this up, but just kind of listen a little bit. So this, this data really isn't meant, this is kind of meant for humans to consume. This is organized for humans to look at. This is not the way you would export data if you're going to try to import it into some database or something. But this is the way that FBI publishes the data. Here's table number nine, Texas. Offenses known, this is offensive known, offenses known to law enforcement. So I guess when someone re reports a crime, they roll that those reported crime numbers up to the FBI. And so what we're seeing here is that there were a total of four violent crimes in the year 2000, uh, 2011 at Abilene Christian University. And what were they? They were all aggravated assault, probably against the professors. <laughs> Remember, oh, this is a great story. I wish I had the details on this one. The Stanford graduate student who was working on a PhD, and his advisor just wouldn't, would never sign off. I don't know the details about why, but just would never sign off. The guy snapped. He took a hammer and he beat his professor to death. He just, just killed his professor. That would have shown up as aggravated assault here. So this we got the number. Probably before they were reporting. <laughs> anyway, he like comes up for parole. You know, so coming up for parole. A condition of your parole is that you're not to go on to Stanford University campus. 
anymore. So I forget. I'll do my time. <laughs> Just, yeah, I'm glad it wasn't my school. Anyway, they told us that when we were doctoral students. You know, I'm not sure if they were giving us ideas or, or reminding the faculty that they should treat us nice because you never know what might happen. Okay. Um, so ultimately, what we're using these files for today is we're just using them to have some files to work with. But it turns out that these are the very files you're going to use for the next project. Now, the projects that you're probably thinking about now, if you think about the project that's due a week from today, is the Uniform project. This is now kind of getting you ready for the project after this one, which students agree, 9 out of 10 students agree, is the most difficult project. Is that why it's worth the most points? That's why it's worth the most points. Um, and so that's, you don't have the background to do this one yet, so we're, gonna, we're still going to cover this coming up in time to do this project. But the context for the project is getting data into a database management system. So you're here working in Excel, but you're going to have to interact with the database management system and push data into it from Excel. So we've got this data that comes to us from the FBI in a really bad format. You know, there's, there's no automatic import that's going to look at this and import it correctly. You're going to have to write a program that kind of comes through here and parses it. And so today we're looking at how can we manipulate these files, but ultimately you're going to have to manipulate these files in such a way that you can pull the data off of them. And so the stuff we're doing today is going to be directly relevant to that project, and I mean directly relevant. Uh, maybe so much relevant in future years, I'll have to reduce the amount of points because this is going to substantially reduce the, the amount of work you'll have to do. Good question? Okay, so since I have your attention here on this, let me just kind of point out a couple of things. Violent crime is a summary of these four. Ultimately, when it comes to importing, you don't need to import the violent crime number. Same thing with property crime. It's a summary of the next four after. Uh, if we ever kind of look at the difference between BYU and University of Utah, we'll see that they have a lot more crime in all categories except for arson. We are able to excel in arson. I don't know why that is. But all the rest of these, University of Utah beats us there. Okay. So, um... So, that's the set of files that we're going to work with. We'll close that, and then let's go ahead and get to some code. Hmm. Let me come back and view my project browser, Project Explorer. Um, so here's book one. I'm going to insert a module into book one. And I got a brand new blank module. This is the one. So, our first task is going to be to allow the user to choose a folder. Now, this is a little warning. The Project itself doesn't have the doesn't allow the user to choose the folder. It's going to be located in a specific place that you can reference. But for, for today, we're seeing okay. We want to have that folder extracted somewhere. We want to be able to uh, refer to it. So here we go. Let's make a sub procedure called choose sub procedure sub procedure called choose folder. Or I'll call it this. I'll call it get folder path. So we're going to see now how to use the file dialog. So we can a variable we'll called fd as a file dialog. All right. So this, of course, is an object variable. Um, it is allowed to bind on any on, bind onto any object as long as it's of the type file dialog. So if I decide I want to hook up this object variable to a worksheet, it'll just say, no, you can't do that. It's only allowed to hook up to file dialogs. So now let's go ahead and connect this on to a file dialog. So I'm going to say set fd equal to application dot file dialog. And then in parentheses, i got to tell it which kind I want. There's the file picker, the folder picker, the Open and save as. These are the four file dialogs we have to work with. And I want the folder picker. So the idea here is we just want the user to be able to open up this dialog box, navigate around until you say, aha, that is the folder that I want. And we'll have it tell us what that folder is. And now that we've created that object and we've, we have the object variable, we have it bound onto a newly created object. The file dialog is a method. It returns a reference to the file dialog object, whichever one is indicated here. But this doesn't show that dialog. If I want to show the dialog, I have to use the object I just bound to it, fd.show. Now, we're not quite there in 
chair isn't making this functional yet, but this should work. I mean, when I play this, it should show that file dialog. There it is. Okay, we can kind of go around to the different folder, go find that folder, <coughs> say OK, and then it continues executing and doesn't have an error. So we've got the code working so far, but, but we haven't seen yet how to ref refer to the item that the user selected. Well, it turns out that the file the file dialog can be you know, different kinds of things. It can open folders or files, or just get a path to open or, or save a file. But if I set it up to open files, the user can select multiple files. The user can say, I want this file, and this file, this file, I want all the files in this folder. That's the set of files that I want. And so this file dialog object is capable of having multiple items selected simultaneously. You, you remember working with the list box, where we can say, yeah, we've got several of these things selected at the same time. And that's the same thing here. So we need it. So even though for the folder picker, there's only one, you can only have one thing selected, this is going to be a little bit weird because the whole environment can select more. So here's how we do it. Let's just say debug.print items. It's a collection. I'm just going to tell it I want the number one item. You can only ever get one item selected. So that's the one I want. So now when I run this, it should print the path of the file of the folder that I had selected. So I did. But that introduces a problem. Because now if I run it and decide, oh, you know what? I don't really want to do whatever I was doing here. I'm going to cancel. How many items will be selected? Zero. There will be zero items in the collection. And I'm telling it I want to print the name of the first item in the collection. No can do. So I get an error. Debug. See right here, there is no collection. Oh, what are we going to do? It turns out the show method is actually a function. It's going to return a value, yeah, a Boolean value, debug.print. Let me print the show here for a moment. Let me comment out printing the name here just so we see just the, the, um, the response from here. And let me convert it to a Boolean. Returning a Boolean value, but it's numeric. It's a little harder to see. But now I'm going to go ahead and run this. I'm going to click OK. And when I click OK, it prints true. Th this returns true when the user clicks OK. I'll run it again. And this time I'm going to cancel it, and that returns false. So I can tell if the user clicks OK or cancel based on the value that is returned by FD show. So now I'm just going to come here and say if FD show, then print the Why I have a space for every single row. Every single second. So far, so good. So now, if I run and hit cancel, it won't have an error. That's the point. Cancel, no error. If I run it and select folder, then it will print the path for me. What I'd like to do is I would like to make this into a function. I would like to have it be where in my code I can just say, I can just call get folder path and it will do all this and just send me back the path that was selected. So let's convert this sub procedure into a function procedure. So we'll change the keyword sub to function. Now, because the function is going to have a return type, if I don't specify a return type, it's going to return variant type, but I'm going to make it a string. Now, instead of printing the name, I'm going to set the name of the function equal to that value. So now it's a function. I can call a function, and it will send back. What will it send back if the user presses cancel? It's going to send back something. An empty string. It will send back an empty string. Why? Because you're only passing it a value, or you're only returning a value if uh, the user clicks OK. That's right. If they click OK, we're going to hit this line. Otherwise, we're not going to hit this line. But why does it return an empty string? Because it's default value. Default value string. for a string type is empty string. So if I never set the value, it's going to return its default value. So that looks really good. Okay. If you've already done the, if you've already done the, the homework <laughs> that was due tonight, this should look really familiar. If not, take a good look. You'll need to do this sometime between now and midnight. It's, it's not exactly this, but it's really simple.
Okay, so now what I would like to do is I would like to see what it takes to say, all right, the user has given us a folder. Now let's get all the file names that are in that folder. Let's actually read through that folder and pull the file names in. To do this, we've got to set the Wayback Machine for the 1970s. Um, it, it turns out that Microsoft has made you know, kind of more up-to-date objects for dealing with folders and files in folders and such, but they made them only for Windows. So what we're, I'm going to show you the way it's built in. It's native to VBA because that will work in the Windows operating system or on the Mac operating system. And it's not, it's really not that hard to do. But um, you can do this along with me if you want, or I will just show it to you. Uh, I'm going to run CMD. Yeah. Hard to imagine, but back in the early days, this is all a computer was. There were no pictures. It was just characters. And if you want to see the files that were in a bigger folder, you would type in DIR. And it would list off uh, all the files and all the other directories that are in there. Uh, let me go to my desktop. I think I got much of my desktop. DIR. Give me a directory. There we go. So, ooh, VBA cheat sheet. And we've got all this stuff. I remember the first computer we had that you could do DIR on. You could like watch those files go across. There was plenty of time to read the files as they were scrolling across the screen. Um, in fact, I remember getting the new computer. Wow, the directory happened so fast you couldn't read it. I was just going by. You had to figure out how to slow things down. So now let's say this. Let's say I only want to see the XLSM files. DIR star dot XLSM. Have you seen this stuff before? How many of you are going? I've never worked with a command prompt before. That's few people. Okay. So um, so this part right here, this dir and putting a a um, wild card here to say, show me every file. Don't show them all to me. Just show me the ones that start with anything, have a dot, and then say XLSM. Uh, and now that's a, that's a smaller list. I wonder if I have any XLSX files here. Yeah, there's just two. Founding quotes and founding quotes one of XLSX. And let's see if I might be able to shrink this down just a little bit here. Can I see font here somewhere? So you can kind of see here is the here's the file name, here's how many bytes are in it, when it was created, uh, and so forth. But this same idea, this dir got copied directly into VBA, so it's part of the language. And so let's take a look. So let, me, let me create a sub procedure up here, a sub called process all files. And what I'm going to want to do is I want to let the user pick a folder. So I'll go ahead and declare dim path as a string. And then I'm going to give path a value. Path <coughs> equals get folder path. Now, I think right now I better check to see if the user pressed cancel. What would I write here to say, you know, if the user pressed cancel, get me out of here? What, what, what? Tell me that line of, of code. What would it be? Get folder. In the back, what back? Would it be get path equals zero? Path equals or empty string. Empty string. I'll give you the then. The then is a gimme in this case. <coughs> and what? No, um, then Anyone else want to chime in and help here? Just by exit sub. Exit sub, yeah. So. Because if the user hits cancel when we're setting up get folder path, if the user hit cancel, it's going to return an empty string. So after we've done that, if it's an empty string, get me out of here. Otherwise, we know we've got a path that we've got to work with. And that path actually comes back without the trailing slash. I'm going to want that trailing slash, so I'm going to go ahead and concatenate that onto it. So I will say that path equals what it used to be plus application.path separated. That's just the forward and backward slash backslash here in, in Windows. But if we're doing this in the Mac, it would be a different thing. Forward slash. All right, so now what I'd like to do is see how can I iterate across all the files in that, or, or all the Excel files. I just want to see the Excel. If someone's put some text file in here or some picture, I don't want to try to open it. Just the Excel files. And so there's a new statement for this. To do this, I'm going to need a, well, 
I'm going to work with a variable called file name. <coughs> this is string. I'm going to do this file name equals dir. The same statement that I use over here, EIR, to get a listing of my files, is the same as a VBA, built in VBA function. Now I have to tell it where I want to look. Where do I want it to look? I'm going to look at the path. Actually, but not just the path. Because if I do DIR, uh, let's see. So here I've got the path. Let me, I'm going to change directories to my root directory. And I'll do a DIR here, and I'm going to specify this as the directory. Uh, I forgot how to mark some. Okay, so dir of that, and now I'm going to put the star dot xls x. So what am I doing? So here it is. Here's dir. The whole the path with the trailing slash, and then the wildcard here. Now we do that same thing here when I do the dir statement inside of EBA. And so path, I've already put that backslash on the end of whatever path came back, so that's there. But now I'm going to concatenate on star dot xls. Hmm. And I guess I'd be glad to take an xlsx or an xlsm, so I'll put a question mark. Question mark, asterisk means any number of characters, I don't care what they are, or even no characters would be okay. Question mark says exactly one character, we don't care where it is. So this will now be xlsb, xls. X, XLSM, XLS anything, but those are the three file types I'm actually trying to find. But, for example, if there were two more characters, it would. If there was a file that was XLSBM, yeah. then that would not, then this dir statement would not return that file because it is looking for just one extra character. If you had another, a second. If you put a second question mark, you would say there's got to be two files. Two, I don't know what they are, but there's got to be two characters here. If I said, you know what, zero files or any number of files, that would be an asterisk. So that, so you might think this is going to return a collection or something, but this was brought into the basic language before the notion of a collection existed. And so this does something quite unexpected. It brings back one of the files, the name of one of the files. So let me come in here. Oh, let me just, I'm going to hard code the path. So let me get the path by saying I want to print, get folder path. Get folder path equals that. Uh, let me go find, let's see, let me go find my data that has all the, I'm looking for, I think I put it in my documents. Fine, that's the one I want. Okay, so that's bringing back this crime this year. So let me go ahead and, and run this this dir statement here with everything hard code. Okay, so here I'm, I'm I'm doing the same thing that this this line is doing here. So giving a dir. I've got like 48 files here that will meet this criteria, and this is going to return one of them. What good is that? I need them all. It gives me just the first one. Aha, here's the truth. If I ask it again, it's going to give me the same file. But if I ask it again without telling it where to look, it remembers where it last looked. And that will bring back the next file. And that will bring back the next file. And that will keep bringing back a different file until what? Yeah, until it reaches the end. What does it do when it gets to the end? Thank goodness it doesn't start over. I'm, I'm more than halfway there. You'd think this would be easier. What if I played more video games? Ah, there it was. Wyoming was the last one. Was it a return? Empty string. Empty string. You ask it one more time? Error. So you gotta watch for when it comes back as an empty string, and with an empty string, you go, okay, I'm done with that list. Here, 
here's, here's the downside. The downside is, let's say you're, you're saying, I want to process a bunch of files. And there's lots of work to do to process these files. So I get the first one, and then I send it off to go process it. If somewhere in that processing, I get another dir statement, what's going to happen to my other list? Poof. It's gone. So, you know, this, remember back, this is the 1970s. And the answer to that question is, why would you ever want to process a list while you're processing another list? You know, I mean, we had like 640,000, I mean, we had, we had 0.6 megabytes was the most memory we had on any computer. Any personal computer. I mean, it was just, these were things we didn't think about. Yeah. Uh, and so what we're going to do is we're going to see a, a good way to be able to use this in today's world. There we go. Let's start off just by getting these all to print off. So now that we kind of see the way we can use dir by specifying a folder in conjunction with dir without specifying a folder, talk to me. How am I going to print off all of the files in the selected folder, all the Excel files in the selected folder? What do you think? What structure am I going to use? What VBA structure? I'm going to use a, not an array, a, a, a loop. Yeah, some loop. Now, for each would be great. If this, if when I said dir, it brought back a collection of all of these, I can do for each. Yeah, I can be a collection there, but it sounds like it's got this into string. So for each is I'm going to do it. What kind of loop should I use? Do and tell. Yeah, do and tell. We don't have any idea how many they're going to be. So each time we're going to check to see, are we done? Are we done? If not, keep going. So I'm going to say, let's see, file equals there. Give myself a do and a loop. And okay, yeah, do and tell. Do and tell what? So the file name is equal to zero x string. Now, we better set that file name to something different inside this loop. So file name equals what? Dirt. Put the opening and closing parentheses on it to kind of let folks know hey, that's a function, by the way, but we're not sending anything. That looks pretty good. Although, just because I've got a do loop here, I should probably do a do events. It's not just a do loop. It's not that it's a do loop, it's that a loop. Right? That'll let me out if I get into an accident, I get into an accident loop. And then let's, let's go ahead and do something in here. Let's go ahead and uh, print. Let me print the whole thing. I want the full path here. So path, the same path I used to, to find these files, concatenated with the file name. And so now, when I run this, it should let the user pick a folder, and then it should print off the names of all the Excel files in that folder. Question? Because you started the dir outside the loop, in the loop, is that going to skip the first value and do the first value that makes sense? Yes, it will, unless I, I'm printing the value before I do the next dir. Let's just follow it through. So here, I say file name is going to equal something. What is it? The first value back. It's going to check immediately. Is the file name blank? What would it mean if the file name was blank right now? There were, there were no files that met this criteria in the folder. The user can pick any folder they want. If there's no Excel files in there, I'm not going to be printing anything. We're not going to process it. It's got to be an Excel file. So we check immediately. Is it blank? If it's blank, there was none. Skip the loop. Ah, but if it's not blank, now we're going to print the file name. What does file name have in it at this point? The result from our very first one. After we print the file name, we're going to pull a new value for file name here for, to check to see if we get the next file from the list. Got it? Okay, that should do it. I think if I run this, it's going to ask me where I'll look. And then we're not much file names. I'm going to go ahead and clear off what I have here in my media window. Run this. I'm going to choose crime. And sure enough, here we have file names, the full path to these file names. That feels pretty good. This is different. This is kind of a different approach than we've done. We haven't really done anything quite like this before, where it, where VBA remembers where you are on some list, and the next time you make a statement, it behaves a little bit differently. Make a call to this dir function, you can bring back a different value. Okay. And so, here, instead of printing, if I was doing some complex um, work on these files, I could just put it right here. Instead of printing, I could do whatever work that is. But instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, let me create a collection, blank collection, and let me, before I go and do any other work here, let me just read these files and put their, their paths to these files into the collection. And then, once I built that collection, I don't care what somebody else does with dir. I call some other procedure. It has a dir, and that's okay. I've 
right here where I'm in control of everything, I've put those file names into my collection. So let's build a collection for that. Dim files as a collection. Okay, this would be like a great final exam question. Does this create a collection? When this dim is processed, does it create a collection? True or false? When this line is processed, a collection will be created. That is false. Why not? It sure looks like it's making a collection. What is it making? Space and memory. Space and memory. It's making a variable. And what is that? What's that variable going to hold? Objects. It's an object, yeah, it's going to hold, it's not be variable, so it can hold only a memory address for an object somewhere. So what we're saying here is that we've got an object variable here that we want to bind on to a collection. The, the only kind of object it can connect onto is a collection, but the collection hasn't been made yet, right? It's analogous to saying dim s, dim s as a worksheet. This doesn't create a worksheet, this creates a variable that's allowed to connect onto a worksheet. This doesn't create a collection, it creates a variable that's allowed to connect onto a collection. And so I'll collect that on, I'll, I'll make that onto a collection right here. Now most of the objects we've connected onto have been objects that already exist, bind onto a worksheet that already exists, or you know, we, we call the function that makes a new worksheet and then we bound onto it. But in this case, we're gonna have to create the collection ourselves. So we're gonna say set files equal to a new collection. New collection says, ah, oh, this is a type of object, Go make one of these things. New says, make one of these. And then this will return the reference to that newly created collection. That collection object's got all kinds of properties and methods. It's got an add property that lets me add things into the collection. It's got a count property uh, that lets me see how many items are in the collection. So we'll create that object, and it will give me this file's handle, this variable, to be able to refer to it. This would, this would be really good. I want to show you a shortcut for doing this. This, this pattern is so common. Declare a variable that can collect onto this kind of object. Now bind that object onto a new, bind that variable onto a new one of those objects, is that you know we petitioned Microsoft. A bunch of us got together, we signed a petition. Wouldn't you please add something to this language? Let us put the word new right here. And then not have to do this line. That says, oh, you're declaring the variable. Let's go ahead and build the object now and bind this variable onto that object. The, the two are exactly identical. If I take this, this out and then later say, bind it onto a new collection, or just put new in here. In case you're wondering, we didn't really position Microsoft. I don't know how it happened. But that was a new feature they added to one of the bind it to All right, so now, instead of just printing this, name of this folder, we are going to add it to the collection. So the name of the collection is files, and we're going to call the add method. And we're going to add in the full path to that file. So this whole list that we used to print up the immediate window, we're just going to put it in a collection. And now that we've got that coming into the collection, here instead of doing a debug.print, we're adding it to the collection. I'll have a separate loop that processes that collection. 4x equals 1, 2, files.count. I'll have to go back and declare x here, which I'll do in a minute. Next, debug.print files yes, sub x. That should behave the same, but you'll see now that instead of just printing it directly as I got the file names, I'm reading those file names into a collection, and then as a separate process, I'm iterating across that collection. Let me go ahead and declare x as an integer or as a long integer. Yes, integer should be fine. Now I should be able to run this again. It should behave exactly the same as it did before. I choose the folder. It scrolls off the files that are Excel files. That's going for those water bottles. I wish I bought my water bottles. It's kind of hard. And the rule doesn't really help them a lot. <laughs> okay. How are we doing, folks? Can we just show a little bit more of this so we can see it all together? It's not quite everything. Got some dims up there. Questions?
earlier, you said that you can only select one item, and so selected items for where we had, um, where we're doing the file dialog, selected items, you said it was always one. But what if you could select more than one item? Okay, so the question is, I got a file dialog. We see down here that you know, we're assuming there's only one. We're returning the first selected item. What if there was going to be more than one? And the answer is, that can happen if I have a file picker instead of the folder picker. And that just means that right here, I need to iterate across this collection. And if we look up right here, I'm iterating across a collection called files. Well, there's a collection here called file dialog dot selected item. I can iterate across that one just the same way I iterate you know, for x equals one to selected items dot count. And then I could process all those files individually. Does that make sense? Okay, so now what I'd like to do is I would actually like to process these files. So instead of printing off these names, I'm going to call another sub procedure. And I'm just, so, so this one's called process all files. I'm going to make another one called process one file. And I'm going to pass it that same text that I just printed into the intermediate window, that full path, I'm going to pass that to my process one file. I've got to make that. Sub procedure that hasn't been made yet, but we're going to make it right now. So, sub process one file. Now, what do I have to put inside the parentheses here? Based on the way I'm calling this, I've got to do something inside these parentheses. What is it? Someone say it was conviction. I'm calling it right here. So here, it's a little bit weird because I made the call before I ever made the sub procedure. So I'm saying I'm going to call the sub procedure called process one file, and I'm going to send to it one of these paths. I, mean, I used to print these things. Now I'm sending. Now I'm going to be sending them off somewhere else. Passing a parameter. Yeah, I have to find a parameter here to be able to receive the string that we're sending down here. So let's call it the file name. File path. We'll give this file path out of it. As a string. So now, anytime I try to call process one file, it's going to say, great, you can't run this unless you supply a value for the file path, which is exactly what I'm doing here. So this loop is saying I'm going to go through all the, one at a time, I'm going to go through all the elements in this collection. The first time I call process file, I'm going to I'm going to send the number one element of that collection. Next time through, X will be incremented. It'll send number two, then number three, and so on. Go ahead. I think we may have talked about this already, but why didn't you put the parentheses up here in the top of the Why don't I put the parentheses here? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Okay. You so, don't care about what it returns? Is that right? It's because we don't care about what it returns. Not only that, it doesn't return anything because... This is a sub procedure. It won't return anything. So yeah, we don't need these parentheses. And if I had if I had more than one parameter here, I couldn't put the parentheses. So it's quirk of the VBA syntax that if it's just one parameter, I can put the parentheses around it. Let's not think too hard about why that is for now. Unless you want to. You want to explain that? Why does it work with one and not with two? sees those as, as parentheses similar to the ones you use to bind a mathematical expression together, right? Do x plus 1 and, and do that and then multiply it to something else. And so because there's only one argument, it goes, oh, you're just you're just kind of telling me to do this before I do something else, and that's okay. There's something got a comma in there, it goes, you know how to do that. Okay. Process one file. I'm going to pass that in. Okay, so now, again, we can just now print... If I wanted to print this same thing up here, I mean, if, if when I run this, I want it to still behave the same and actually print, what do I say print here? Do I say print files X or something else? Say it louder. File path. What would happen if instead of file path, I put in here files X? Here I say, you know, I'm going to print, I'm saying, you can say print files x here, no problem. Now I'm just calling 
process file, or process one file, on the ultimate file X here. Why not? We said it. Yeah, it's out of scope. That, fi that file is declared here. It's only accessible from inside the subprocedure. And so it's not available here. Not only is files out of scope, what else? X is out of scope. It doesn't know anything about what's going on. But the whole point is here is that I sent that string from files X into this variable file path. And so I'm just going to say print file path. We'll do it one more time. It should still print off all of those file names. Uh, oh, should be debug gun. You're confused by that? Where's the debug? Why is the debug gun? Because of the heat. It's the heat. I didn't test it by the sun. It's really all on. But now the whole idea here is that I've got a lot of I've got a lot of logic up here where I'm dealing with all the files and, and you know, trying to figure out which files I'm going to process. But now here, I've isolated the, the heavy lifting that I have to do with this file when I get it open. Now I can just work on doing that one at a time. I've isolated the work that's actually getting done on the file, put it in its own procedure, and that's going to be great for me to, to do this development. In fact, what's this? So for development, folks, it's like a separate process to figure out how to get all these files, to process all these files. I don't really want to have to think about and, and kind of conflict all of this with what takes the process one file. So I'm going to create a sub procedure here that is meant in, that is meant strictly for debugging. It's not a procedure any user will ever run. It's just for my ease of use while I'm while I'm developing. Uh, I'll call it a sub sub procedure. I'm going to call it the ACME A C M E uh, procedure runner. Sounds like something Wiley Coyote would have ordered on Saturday morning to get the roadrunner. Make a reference to Roadrunner. Do you guys have any idea what it is? Yeah. Okay, good. Just check. And all I'm going to have this do is I'm going to have this run. I'm going to call. I'm going to make a call of a to process one file with a single path. Right. This loop up here is it's just sending a path. It's just sending a different path each time it's called. While I'm trying to get process one file to do what I want it to do, I don't want to have to deal with 50 of these things coming at me. One's enough. And so while I'm running here, I'm going to use my Acme procedure runner. It's going to call process one file, and it's going to send it just one path. I know exactly what. And you know what? After I've got Ohio working the way I want it to work, I'm going to send in North Carolina. I'll send in Oklahoma. So again, it's really just for you, but why did I call it the Acme Procedure Runner? Because when I'm down here, I'm working on getting this, this is going to get a little more complex, but I'm working here on getting process one file to do what I want it to do. I am so used to saying, oh, I've just, I've just changed something. I want to see how it works. What am I going to do? I'm going to either press the play button or hit F5. I'll hit F5. And it goes, I don't know what you want to run, but you're not running this one. How come I'm not running this one? Process one file is not a choice here. And it didn't run it. That's where my, my insertion point was. Why not? I'm passing in a parameter. It's saying, listen, you can run any procedure you want as long as there's no parameters. As soon as there's a parameter, forget it. Because you can't just run it. You've got to send in a value for the parameter. So why did I call this the Acme Procedure Runner? I want it to be alphabetically first in my list, so I don't have to go find the one I want it to run. I want to be able to, to be right here, hit F5, and go, oh yeah, I have to run that one, hit Enter, it's already selected. Print Oklahoma? Five, yeah, five, yep, yeah, that's the one I want. Let's print in Oklahoma. All the way. So, and again, here at anything, start it with an A. Um, and just make sure it shows up at the top. You know, I can do better. Okay, so now we actually want to open up one of these files and, and do something. So I just got Oklahoma set up the run. I don't know if Oklahoma is a good one to work with or not, but let's go ahead and open it. So instead of debug.print a file path, let's open it. Workbooks. Not open. Hmm. I'm going to want to be able to close that workbook, so I better bind an object variable onto it. MWB as the workbook and set WB 
equal to workbooks.open and in parentheses now the file name. And movie.close. So now, don't, don't all of you do this. It won't take that long on this machine. So now if I come up here and run my process all, I think you'll see it happen. I'm going to pick my crime folder, and it's going through those one at a time. Can you see? Yeah, you can kind of see it up there. California, Colorado, Connecticut, Delaware, Florida, Georgia. It's going through. It's opening. It's not doing very much. It's opening them, and then it's closing it. It's opening it, and then closing it. Opening it. Important to remember to close it. You'll end up with 50 workbooks open if you leave the close. Where are we? New Mexico. It's like eight states that start with N. Moving along, um, it took longer on this computer than I thought it would as well. Ah, we're going to find anything. Okay. So that's the reason we don't want to test this thing by running process all. We want to have process one. You can run process one, but then run it all. Okay, we're done. Try to open it and close it. All right, I'm going to go ahead and put a breakpoint on WB close so it doesn't actually execute that line. I'll run this again. And it should now open Oklahoma. So here's the Oklahoma workbook. So let's see if we can figure out how we're going to deal with this data. I think I get the, I, I normally have the largest kind of grade distribution on this project uh, from all of them. Because there's a lot of nuances here in this data. And we're going to deal with a couple of the major ones here in class today. I haven't done this in past years. I'm just hoping this will make this project a little bit easier for you. At least easier for the ones that actually came to class and paid attention. Or took the time to watch the video. But just take a look at this data and tell me, how are you going to, I'll give you a hint. The data that we have to process starts here in row 6. It's always going to start in row 6. And we're going to have to, ultimately we're going to have to say, all right, at Cameron University, there was an enrollment of 6,330 students. There was no manslaughter. There was no forcible rape. One robbery. And there were two aggravated assaults. Four burglaries, 28 arsons, one motor vehicle theft, and one arson. So we're going to have to kind of ultimately push that into the database. We haven't seen it do that yet. But we're going to have to process that whole row. Processing one row is going to be complex enough, but we also have to process every single row of data. Now, I've given you how this starts. It starts in uh, row six. How are you going to know when the data ends? You have to do row six, and certainly do row seven too. Probably row eight. There are some. There are some states that only have like three universities. Alaska doesn't have a whole lot of universities. It might only have one that we get, that we get data. So how are you going to know when to end? Blake's empty string. That'd be pretty good, except we got footnotes right here at the bottom of the data. Ah, so one thing might you mean this is the border? Yeah. Yeah. That, in fact, kind of disappointed that came up so quickly. That's probably the best way to do it. Virginia didn't hear that. What are some other options? <laughs> Could you search for the one or a blank? Aha. Uh -huh. So you might say, let's keep going down until we find uh, data that starts with one. That actually would also work pretty well for this data. It happens that every state has at least one footnote. Some have several. Every state has at least one footnote. And so that works. I don't like that because next year's data, then we can have a state with no footnotes. And if that's the case, well, if there's no footnotes, then it will be blank cell. Oh, but look for a blank cell is a problem because we got a blank cell right here on row 13. We got blank cells in the data. How about um, the cell two to the right of, the, of that one being blank? The cell two to the right. Oh, this one? Yeah, but, like, yeah. Like, you mean? Well, we got, unfortunately, we got missing data. In fact, what's that? Another one? This one? We'll talk about that in a minute. So here, we've got Tulsa, and it's got a footnote. Caution to be exercised making any inter-campus comparisons. Right in school, because University of Canada Crime Studies, in fact, by writing that, whatever, okay, so. But for whatever reason, we don't know, for this year, we don't have the enrollment for, uh, for the Tulsa campus of Oklahoma State University. So, 
of you think, aha, but maybe we're not going to have any blanks in the sum of violent crime. Um, actually, by the, by the way, violent crime really is just the sum of these next three, these next four columns. That has a three because there's a two and a one, and two zeros over here. Uh, we don't see any blank ones here. Yeah, that might be a that might be a, a rabbit hole that you would go down. But some of these states are missing data. Is there a difference between having zero and having blank there? Yeah. What's the difference? Yeah, this when it's a zero, we're saying oh, I've got all the reports in. Nobody, and there, there were no reports for here. What does this mean? We didn't get the report. We don't know why, but we don't have the report. And there are even some times when the summary ends up being blank. There is no column of data that you can look at here for this data set and just rely on that being, just go until you run out of data. So we're going to rely on the underscore, on this, on this rule. I think that really is the most reliable way. The only problem is, what happens? How do we know that? What, what's the property involved here? You don't have any idea? I don't know, and I've solved this problem for like 10 years now. I still don't remember. So let me just go ahead and let's, let's see. I'm not going to do this on the Oklahoma. Let me come to, the, to book one. And let me just record myself putting a bottom border on so I can see if I can deal with it. So uh, record a macro. Oh, I must be in break mode. Let me go ahead and stop my code. I am going to come into... I'm kind of expecting somewhere there to be a button <coughs> that says record macro. All right, developer record macro. There's usually a little button down here somewhere. Is it under my, maybe it's underneath my stuff. I think it is, yeah, because your name is. Record macro, macro one is great. And I'm just going to come right here and I'm going to do, where is the border thing? Here's the border. Oh, it's already set up for bottom border. That's great. I think I put a bottom border on that. Yep, I'm going to stop recording. So. Let's go look at the, at the code that it generated. I'm going to go ahead and close Oklahoma while I'm at it. And save. And here's module two. Great. Looks like it took a lot of code to put that bottom border on. But as I look at this, I'm going to realize, oh, wait a minute. There's something else going on here. It's saying with whatever is selected, let's talk about the borders of that selection. And we're talking about the diagonal down border. Line style, none. There's no diagonal down border. There's no diagonal up. There's no left or top or right or vertical or horizontal. But there is a bottom edge. And we're changing that to what? We're changing the line style property of that to Excel continuous. OK, so that should be what I need, what I need to know. Oh, but I haven't even made a loop to get started yet. So I'm going to try to iterate across that data and just print off the names of the universities. So I'm in process one file. Let me do an R as R as a long integer. R is going to start off at six. Got a do loop here. We have a do events in the middle here. Also better anything with R. And I'm going to do until, do until cells, let me make sure I'm talking about the right workbook. WB dot, can't go straight from the workbook to the cells, I gotta go to the sheet. The good news is there's only one sheet in these workbooks we're opening, so how do I get to the right sheet? Sheets one, first sheet in the workbook is only one. Dot cells, row number R, column number one, dot borders, XL bottom, dot line style, equals continuous. And make sure I spell it all right. U N T I. So we're going to keep going until we get to that continuous bottom border. Let's go ahead and print the name of the universe. Dot print value. So now when I run Oklahoma, I can see all the universities from Oklahoma printed off into my immediate window. Uh, 
this looks pretty good. Cameron, East Central, Northeastern, Northeastern State, Oklahoma City University. It all looks great. Oh, this is kind of bad. This is kind of bad for my example. We do get them all. Let me, I'm going to change the data here. Let me split this one off. Um, it's, it's a quirk of Oklahoma. Actually, let's get away from Oklahoma. Let's try Texas. Close Texas, include Oklahoma. Stop my code. I think maybe Texas is a better, is a better example for this. So I'm going to change my, I'm going to change my Acme procedure runner to run in Texas. Run in the state of Texas. <coughs> Same problem in Texas. The problem is we've got a merge cell at the bottom. Oh, we don't. West Texas A&M. Okay, okay so we've got West, West Texas A&M here at the very bottom. So how do we? How did our code do in terms of processing that our data? Where do we start? We start Abilene Christian. Abilene Christian, Alamo, Alvin, Amarillo. We've got a lot of A colleges. Uh, Abilene, Alamo, Alvin, Amarillo, Angelo, Austin. We've got them all. Abilene, yeah, we've got them all. Wonderful. And Central we've got University of Texas, we've got them all. Except for who? Why don't we get West Texas? We were doing so well. We got them all. Why don't we miss West Texas? Yeah. It's because this. Um, is Texas it's is a really big state. It got tired before it got to the end. It's just too many of them. No one was. It's because we're doing do and tell. And so as soon as it sees that the, the cell has a bottom border, it'll stop running. And once it gets to, to row 78, that cell has a bottom border, so it stops. That's right. We are looking for the cell that has the bottom border. As soon as we hit this bottom border, as soon as we say r equals r plus one, we then come back up here. We ask, does that cell have a bottom border? It goes, yes, it does. And before we've ever printed it, we drop out of the loop. Oh. So what should we do? Loop until instead of do until. Ah, all right. Well, let's push this down to the bottom. And what we're going to find out, that is exactly the same thing. And, and realize that the, the only difference that it makes is the first time through, oh. right? Because this, what's, what line happens right after this one? This one, there's, not, there's no logic that happens between those two, so that's not going to do it for us. Other thoughts? Yep? Is there some sort of downloadable Okay, so we could be we could be having something that's a little bit more sophisticated in here. Uh, we could do that too. Um, there's a better, better solution. Is there something like do while not? Yep, it's do while not. Not just this is this is logical. So do until we could change this to not in here because this whole thing just has to be logical here. So we can throw it out in there, but I don't think it's going to solve our problem either. What if you just run two loops, one do until, and then just the same exact loop for do while, so that it does it that one time? And then... Just do that one time? You might be able to make that work. That's 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 way too much work for me. I'm, we got 15 minutes. So, is there a question in the back? No comment here in the front? R plus one, do until cells R plus one, come one. So you're just looking at the next row down instead of the row you're already on. Until, oh. That might It's like offset, that. but you're just adding one to the R variable at the beginning. Oh, I hate the sense that, that might be a pretty good solution, because that's not what I was saying. The problem with this is that if I have only one, if I have only one column, then that's going to be a problem. So I think that's not going to be a solution. I'm not positive that might work. All right, last guess, and then I'll show you my brilliant solution. Is it the same as the top border for the next one down? Ah, yes! That wasn't a brilliant solution. So it turns out I can either look at the bottom row or I can look at the top. I mean, look at the, the, the bottom border or the top border. And the bottom border of one cell is the top border of the next one. So instead of looking for edge XL bottom, let's change this to top. You're going like, to like what this does the first time through. We're not quite there yet. So let's go ahead and run this now. Let's see, what do we got? We got Texas still open. We can close Texas. Now let's run this again. We didn't get anything now. Why not? The first one, the first one has a top order. Oh, no. 
<laughs> but we're going to use a, the conjunction of something that someone else, I forgot who it suggested. But now, even though after the first iteration, this, it doesn't matter whether this is at the do or the loop level, now we put it at the loop level, now we're guaranteed to run the first time through. We add, all, we add one onto R, so the first time we actually check this, we are now, we've processed that first line. And we are now looking at the next line. If that's the one that has the border at the top, we're done. Otherwise, we keep going. This should get them all. So I'm just going to drag my insertion point or my current position indicator back to R equals 6. And I'll run this code again. And now we should start at Abilene. We've got Abilene Christian. And we're ending up getting West Texas at the end. So, Jaron, you can anticipate less questions about how to iterate across this data when we get to this part. Yeah, because there's a lot of questions that come up. Okay. How are we doing? Let's see. What else should we look at? We got like 11 minutes. Jaron, this is our kind of our chance to make this project easier. Anything else we should do here? And the option is to make the students love you and say, that's it. Okay, so here's here's a problem that you won't, you know, until you work on this for a little while. Let's say you picked this one. Do you, do you know a state that doesn't have a canvas? Rhode Island's kind of weird anyway. Maybe they don't make things so. uh, Let's try, I think Alaska does. I don't, maybe Utah doesn't. Let's try Utah. I think like Utah's done better. Yeah, okay, so here's Utah. So in, our, in all of our reporting, it turns out, you, does the Utah State University have different campuses? Yes. Yeah, they do. But for whatever reason, these are all reported at the university level. So here's the, here's the thing that's a little bit weird, is that when none of the data here, when, when none of these have campuses, what do they do to the campus column? Texas got a whole column for campus, just so we can say, oh yeah, a couple of these, we'll be Texas A&M, we've got all these different campuses. But over here, the data's not reported that way, the column's gone. The thing is, you're going to have to come and get student enrollment. On Utah, it's in column B. On Texas, it's in column C. What are you going to do? Couldn't you? So the top section is always in the same spot. The top, uh, yeah, the row, that, the row that has these headers is so always here. So could you check and see the B5 says campus? If it doesn't, then you can insert. Oh, that's a brilliant, brilliant solution. So yeah, let's do this. Let's say, uh, I lost my code. Where's my code? Here's my code. All right, so we've got, we've got the workbook open. The workbook open. Here, where are we looking? Oh, here it is. We got the workbook open. Now you're saying, all right, let's check and see if wb.sheets one dot cells row number six column number two. If that is not equal to campus, then we're going to do something. To see if that's right. Hello, Texas. Campus. B, oh, it's B5, not B6. So it's row number five, column number two. If that's not campus, it's probably enrollment. Let's be check to see if it says enrollment. Anyway, if it's not campus, we know that this data set doesn't have the names of campuses. And we know that it's our enrollment that's in column two, not our campus. We would really like enrollment always to be in column three. So what do we do? Uh, that workbook, sheet number one, columns, number two, not insert. Let's just go ahead and insert the column there. If there's no campus data, and there's no campus column, put a campus column in there so the rest of the data is in the same place. Now we can rely on column three having the enrollment data. Oh, that's really good. Now this is going to bring one more thing. We've just opened the workbook. And now we have modified the workbook. What's going to happen when we say close the workbook? It's going to launch the statement. 
Does anyone want to say these things? What's the answer to that? False. No. Let me spell out no for you. F-A-L-S-E. Save changes is the first argument on close. Save changes is false. So now we'll close it. We won't save the change. You know what else I might do after that? So let's go ahead and try this with. Uh, let's go ahead and try this with Utah. Let me stop here. Close my other state files. And let's bring in Utah into my Acme procedure window. See, we did it. Yeah, look at that. We now have a blank column right here in column two. We've pushed student enrollment over here to column three. Now, the other thing that might be helpful here is do I need violent crime data? This number right here, it's a summary. I don't need it. Do I need this one? I don't need it. I'm, the, the, the project is going to be to insert. We've got to copy out the raw data from here. We don't need the summary data because our, our database can have with the summary statistics, no problem. We're only going to store the raw data. So let's delete column I and column D while we're at it. So we inserted that. Once we've inserted that, column I, H, I, J, F, 9. Column 9, that delete. And what, what was the other one? D, I believe. Column D, it's column 4. Don't delete them in the wrong order. What would happen if I delete them in the wrong order? Yeah. I mean, if I delete column 9, then 4, I'm good. If I delete column 4, then 9, what's happening? I'm deleting 4 and 10 from the original one because <coughs> column 9 will shift over to column 8, and column 10 will be now column 9. So, so this is kind of another thing that the project doesn't tip you off on this, but this project will get way easier if you say, let me just narrow this down to just the data I have to work with. The fact that I'm changing this worksheet, not a problem, because when I close it, I'm not going to save it. All right, one more thing that might be really helpful is that the labels that are used in the database aren't the same as the labels that are here. Arson, I think, is the only one that's the same. Forceful rate of this too. But this one I think is just called murder. So it might be nice that once we've gotten it down to here, we go ahead and standardize these headers with what we have in our database. I'll just do the first one. So that's going to leave column B to be murder. So I'm going to say WB dot sheets one dot range. That's going to be B5. Value equals none. I'm just going to run back here to run the lines that I missed before. And so now, oh, I got the wrong one. Oh, because I deleted the column. I just did the same thing I said not to worry, not to do. So that needs to be D, not E. I'll go ahead and finish that off, which will close that file and run it again. Now I should have that label set to murder. Column two is set there. I want to make sure the rest of these are the same. Now, when it comes to actually writing, running the structured query language that I'm going to teach you how to run, it'll just be a matter of running right across these, just looping across these, pulling that in, just formulate the statement and say. Okay, so a lot of this you're probably looking at going, ugh. It's okay, you don't really have any scaffolding to hang this on yet. But we have this now as an example on the video. We have this text here, which will be a great step. Coming back to this um, assignment, or not this assignment, but this example from class will be a great place for you to kind of look as a reference to begin starting that project. Not to start the project, but begin starting that project. Okay, any other questions? We did all that in still managed in like three minutes early. Thanks for coming. Class dismissed.